So thanks so much for being here, Susan. It's it's uh, special to to meet and especially to interview, you know, one of someone's philosophical heroes, you know, and you're one of mine. So I really appreciate that you've agreed to do this and that you've given the Knox lecture this year. First question I wanted to ask you is is biographical. So I think choosing to do philosophy is not an obvious choice uh, in, in our world. It's not an easy choice. And I'm always curious to know what motivates people who do choose to do it to do so. So I, I, mean, I wanted to ask you how you found your way into this vocation. Why, why is it that you became a philosopher? How is it that you became a uh, philosopher? Well, so first I should say, um, being of an older generation um, and uh, kind of early in women's liberation generation, um, the idea that, it's, that it was hard to, it's not an easy choice, uh, doesn't really ap apply to, to me. I was, as a girl growing up, there were no expectations on my doing anything, uh, achieving anything. Uh, the, you know, the thought was, do whatever you want, get married, uh, your husband will make the money. And so, uh, in some ways, I felt like I was, it was a more stress-free growing up. Um, so I wasn't looking for a profession or a vocation even. Um, so, but I went to college and I was a math major. I was plan I loved logic, uh, so I was in college to be a logician, and I had the, um, as it turns out, good fortune of having um, as my advisor a very distinguished logician who was a student of Hilbert's, who was a very philosophical logician, and he had created this math and philosophy program and said, I think you should do that. <laughs> so it was partly that, and partly that you know my favorite subjects in school were math and especially logic and literature. And philosophy seemed like a, a field in which you could s somehow take advantage of your love of both things. Uh, so I kind of stumbled my way into it. Uh, and as I said, there was no pressure to get a job mm -hmm. you know, uh, or to do anything with it. So I was lucky. I guess taking that leap from undergrad to deciding to do postgraduate studies in philosophy, was there something in particular that clinched that? Did something that put the idea in your head or? Uh, I had very encouraging professors. They said, you know, mm. you should keep doing this. And I, right, this is not a very inspiring story. I mean, my thought was, I can't ask my parents to pay for anything, but if I had a fellowship, yeah, I loved it. I mean, I loved philosophy. And mm -hmm. um, I went into graduate school still thinking I would be a logician. Uh, but then uh, in order to get a broader background in philosophy before specializing. I found myself taking mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Nagel's seminars, and then it was ethics, free will, those were the things that just got to me, and mm -hmm. I just never looked back, so, yeah. It's interesting you say that logic was your, was your first philosophical love, because I, I wanted to ask you about your distinctive style, your distinctive way of doing philosophy, which I, I find to be unique, and it's part of what I find so attractive about um, the way you approach philosophy. I don't know how you would describe it, uh, or I'm not even sure how I would describe what I find distinctive about your, your work. It seems to me that there's a kind of connectedness to uh, human experience, to human psychology. There's just a kind of warmth about it, uh, and I, that's not to be taken for granted in it's not something you'd say about logicians either, so that's right. why. So I wonder, is that uh, something that you undertake consciously, or is this is this part of a conscious choice on your part? Is this just a natural, inevitable emanation of, of your your personality? Does it connect in any way with what you think the vocation of a philosopher is, or what you think philosophy should be? It's it's maybe semi-conscious. I do think it's sort of just an expression of what the only way I can write um, and, or talk. Uh, and it's also an expression, I don't like to 
universalize about what philosophy should be, like uh, as if all philosophy should be one way and aim at one thing. But um, and this is a difference between wanting to do logic or philosophy as because it's so much fun and I love it, um, and thinking if I'm going to do this as a living and as a career and as a deep part of who I am, what, you know, what's worth doing. Um, so I guess there are two things. One, about the way I write, I, and the way I give lectures also. Um, I have in the back of my mind this, I, this thought that I want to write in a way that my parents would understand. <laughs> My parents are, uh, are uh, deceased now, but I, I mean, it, this was always true. They didn't go to college, and so um, you know, they would have been very turned off by a jargony kind of thing. But I, just the idea of what you know, what if my parents walked into the room and saw me talking about supervenience in this very um, obscure way? It would just like, no, I don't want to be that person. Mm. So there's that um, that I sort of have them in the background. They were very warm. They were very, they had a sense of humor that was very important. So I sort of wanted yeah. that. But I also think, so the kind of philosophy that, um, that I am mostly interested in and that I think is the way I conceive of the discipline as I love it, um, it's not about solving problems. I mean, it's about or making progress. It's about thinking hard about the world in, um, in ways that can kind of expand your mind and expand your outlook. And so I think I write in a way that's meant to just sort of draw people into, like, isn't this uh, a puzzling or problematic issue? And how are we going to think about it? Um, so I, it's not so much that I expect people to be convinced by my views as I want them to get interested, puzzled, and think on their own mm -hmm. about it and think that's, that's what I can contribute. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if that's what shows up or, or not, but um, yeah, that's what I'm conscious. I think that is helpful. That, that explains a lot. Speaking about your, you know, raising problems, drawing people in to, to contemplate, um, life, one of the sort of most famous claims that you've made is about uh, the importance, relative importance of moral values as compared to non-moral values like non-moral pursuits in life, like love, the appreciation of beauty, the pursuit of meaning, even the pursuit of self-interest. And the distinctive claim that you've made about this is that you think, well, it's not the case that morality always wins the day. And a good life is one in which uh, I think individuals find some kind of idiosyncratic balance between non-moral pursuits and moral pursuits. They find their way of, of managing these, these competing goods. And of course, they both are important, but it's not clear that morality always wins. I find myself particularly attracted to that. I think a lot of people are attracted to that view. But I think they're also plagued by a certain... Uh, worry that you know comes from reading papers like Peter Singer's Famine Affluence and Morality. And people think, you know, how, how can I really put my own flourishing before the good of others, the lives of others? There's this sense that, you know, when you think of yourself as one among many, you're crushed by the weight of moral obligation. How do you speak to someone? You know, what, what do we say to someone? What do we say to ourselves when we feel, you know, the compelling nature of that that kind of thought, the drowning children all over, all over the world. How do we stand up for, for an, you know, non, any non-moral good in that kind of emergency situation? Well, an emergency situation as opposed to the standing situation, there are always people drowning. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I don't know if that's, I mean, mm. there's an emergency, here's a person drowning. Yeah. Uh, right at the beach that I'm looking at versus there's always more to do to help people who are desperately needy. Uh, in a way, I think the way you framed it, there's no way out of it. I mean, once you say, once you see 
your choice to go to the movies or you know buy a birthday present for your friend who is not poor um, as opposed to saving a starving child I mean you can't win that comparison um, I, I think it's not more worth I mean it's not more worthwhile to do that mm -hmm. but um, on the other hand I, I think what gives what makes people's lives worth living vary across all kinds of ways and that um, and that to me the best way there's no point in having a morality that that requires you to do so much that you can't live a life that you um, that's worth living right then everything falls apart so I think that my idea is what you want is a morality that is demanding but not so demanding as to you know wash out everything and I don't want everyone to be the same that is I don't want everyone to be uh, moral saints is, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't want everyone to say the only thing that makes my life worth living is making the world a better place I like the fact that there are athletes that there are singers that there mm -hmm. are um, you know, just slackers. I mean, I, right? It's a the world is is good that way. I think. Mm. Um, so, I guess I think what we want. This is a philosophical point, I guess. I, that the best kind of moral theory is one that can expect a lot of people, but also, in some way, make room for people to live mm -hmm. lives that are that are aim that have other aims in sight uh -huh. okay thanks yeah so, I mean you said at the beginning that when you frame the problem in that way there's no way out so is part of the trick not framing things in that way so do we need a moral theory or a way of approaching these problems that just avoids framing them in this in this kind of way well, I, I guess what I had in mind was that you're, it, it sounded as if you're taking um, morality to be the default way to look at the world, something like that. Um, and, and what I was thinking is morality is an aspect of the ways we look in the world, or it's one way, but there are... Um, and that when we ask about what is morality or what does morality tell me to do, we should say, um, right, we should think about that in terms of what kind of principles can I integrate into a good life that will, you know, leave the world a better place, that will keep me from doing, you know, objectionable things. I mean, just, you know, put it, integrate it into an overall individual view rather mm -hmm. than take it as the default overall view from which you have to defend yourself in order to make room for mm -hmm. um, you know an extra latte or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of, of, of you know uh, morality and its pressures uh, just to talk about the Knox lecture for a bit. So yesterday you delivered a, a wonderful Knox lecture you urged the audience to make a distinction between blame and criticism. So I just thought I'd ask you for, you know, for any, any audience members who are on the internet who haven't seen the lecture yet, mm -hmm. why do you think it's so important that we draw this distinction between, between blame and criticism and what got you thinking about these, these questions? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I have a quick answer to that. Mm. Um, I, sp I suppose um, that it comes from, I, I sp spent a lot of my philosophical career writing about responsibility and, um, and a lot of the literature about responsibility, a lot of the ways I think, it's not just the literature and philosophy, I think people think about responsibility in terms of accountability, what can you hold people accountable for. Um, and then 
against that background, the question, there are big debates between people who think you shouldn't hold people accountable for anything, nobody's responsible, or people who are so um, committed to, they want so much to hold people accountable that they will um, do that even when it seems to me there are weighty philosophical reasons to feel that that's unfair. Uh, and I came to think, you know what, we're just over, um, we or they uh, are overly concerned about something that's connected to accountability and the ability to control one's behavior, um, that a lot of what's important in the way we relate to each other isn't really under our control. It's really a matter of, you know, whether we see the world in good or bad ways, whether that, um, mm -hmm. and control isn't at issue. And so, I, um, so an example I use in the lecture uh, is uh, sexists, right? And um, now there are lots of people, I think, uh, who are sexist in ways that are um, obnoxious or, or uh, but that they can't really help it. They, that is, they, um, they grew up looking at the world in this way. It's very hard to change. I mean, e even when they're well-meaning and they hear people make arguments, they think, yeah, I don't think so. I think you're overreacting or they just don't get it. It, it takes a long time. Uh, so if, if you think, look, all right, they're not accountable and they're not blameworthy, then you're supposed to just not judge them at all. Whereas I feel, well, that's, that's just not, those aren't the only options. I mean, if a person is obnoxious, let's say, I mean, leave sexism out for a minute, or, it can't be wrong for you to notice that and say, yuck, I don't want to be with you, right? That, I don't have a moral obligation to not mind people's obnoxiousness, even if they can't help it, right? And the same seems true about sexism, for example. So I thought, look, if you get away from could they help it to, I mean, the fact that they can't help it does mean there's certain things you shouldn't do. You shouldn't punish them, maybe. But you can, you can say, yeah, there's, this is not, you can, complain about them, you can try to correct them, you can, and you don't have to hang around with them. <laughs> so I wanted to just sort of to leave more options open than I thought the uh, literature had. Right. Right. In a way that doesn't just reduce to what you call the objective attitude. On, on the, right. On the so I was just thinking, that. you know, to, yeah. there's human beings, and if they weren't human beings um, who could be changed and who could be reasoned with, well, on the one hand, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be obnoxious, they would just be Right, Ma to be managed. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I thought this is a way of sort of preserving uh, human interaction while getting away from the concern about accountability and punishment. Yeah. Okay, that's very helpful, thanks. So just a few more questions. Uh, the second and last question I wanted to ask you is about future projects or you know, the next project, so you've, you've done really significant groundbreaking work on the nature of value, the plurality of value, freedom and responsibility, meaning in life. Um, I suppose you're, you're, you're retaking up this freedom and responsibility work in, in, this, in this current project. I think you know, people are curious to know what, what you think is next, what, what you want to think about in the future. And I wonder if you could say anything about what you think any new horizons might be for philosophy in general? Are there new problems emerging? Are there old problems that we should be returning to now that we've forgotten about? Uh, I mean, these are big questions, but I wonder, I wonder what you thought about that. Uh, well, as to what's next, um, I work very slowly, so I don't, uh, I don't have a, a huge new problem uh, on the horizon, but actually um, the the paper I gave as the Knox Lecture, um, which was on blame and criticism, is part of a sort of large project that'll take me a while to continue having to do, um, well, the running themes are that uh, focusing on um, 
on a conception of a human being or a person as capable of rational deliberation and self-control uh, has narrowed our vision of what's really important to being human. Uh, so the blame criticism, th that was one way to sort of come at that. Um, but there are other pieces of, other, other ways you can come at it, uh, thinking about art um, again and, and our relation to art and our, you know, what's involved in both being able to appreciate art and produce art. Um, also, rational deliberation and self-control actually has relatively little to do with that. Um, humor, uh, philosophy, it's, so, so there's a, sort of a big project here about what it is to be human beyond the things that uh, philosophy especially has been focused on, which is being a moral agent where that involves rational deliberation and willpower. So that's sort of where that's going. Um, as to new horizons in philosophy, well, there are always new ones, and I, I don't think you can predict them. Uh, um, and so I don't really know what will be the new horizons. I, I will say, since you said any old horizons to come back to, um, I feel as if philosophy um, has changed in, in my professional lifetime in a way that has actually um, de-emphasized an interest in normative moral theory. Um, and that, I think, is regrettable. Or, I mean, maybe, you know, things go back and forth, but um, ethics in uh, analytic philosophy departments these days is, um, I, involves a lot of what's called meta-ethics. I actually don't, even though there's lots of meta-ethics that I find interesting, a lot of it has nothing to do with ethics. <laughs> I mean, it, it has nothing to do with how to live. It's not substantive in those ways. It's more, uh, and that's fine, but it's not a substitute for, you know, thinking about how to live and about what we ought to do and what, our, what we owe to each other. And I feel like that's been... Um, waning in the attention of philosophy lately, and I hope that it goes back in the other direction. So. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. For my <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I, I guess on, on that note, so, so just the, the last question I want to ask you, for younger scholars coming into the discipline or, you know, who've just come into the, to the discipline or trying to find their, their way, you know, you, you you have, I mean, I think people feel pressure to write on hot topics, you know, or sort of ride the wave and, you know, say something that, that seems really pertinent now to, to sort of launch their, their career. And, and that can sometimes come into tension with, I think, talking about what you really want to talk about or finding one's own voice. So as, as someone who, as a philosopher who I think really, you know, has found their own voice, do you have any advice for younger scholars who are sort of navigating the intricacies of that, yeah. of that gauntlet, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my advice is always have a backup career. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I mean, that's not, it's not a happy thing to say. I, I think it's very distressing how mm. the pressures um, of employment uh, are shaping people's uh, research programs, what they write about, what they feel allowed to write about, the degree to which they, it's now, I mean, it really is prudential to just, you know, to strategize what kinds of things will get published, what kinds of things will get, you know, get my name noticed. Um, I despair about this, <laughs> right? And I'm just grateful that uh, the, the pressures weren't so tight at when I, started and also that I just luck I was just lucky enough to not have to do that I mean I, it really depends on what you care about I mean you philosophy as a career is something you have to step back from and say you know why is it something I think is worth doing what is it that I have to say or that I think people should think about 
And at a certain point, you have integrity would suggest if I can't do that, you know, I will. My backup profession was I was going to uh, try to become a pastry chef. <laughs> but but um, you know, there are, there's lots of stuff to do in the world um, that can be good and fulfilling. So right. It's, it's not advice for how to succeed in philosophy. It's rather advice into how to live in a way you're not ashamed of or that you don't feel is, um, you know, has led you where you didn't mean to go. That's very good advice. Thank you very much. Thank you.